Hello and uh, welcome to the first session of our series, Talking Togo. Now, I think we need to give you a bit of a rundown, an explanation, if I may say, preface, whatever you might call it, on Talking Tagore and why are we talking Tagore? Well, the story is like this, that uh, sometime last year, Kahani Kancheti was privileged to host a discussion on a book written by Professor Shushanto Dattagupta, the eminent physicist and himself a former vice chancellor of Vishwabharati, entitled Vishwabharati 1921-2021, a vision betrayed. Professor Dr. Gupta was in conversation with another eminent personality, Dr. Partho Ghosh, who is otherwise known as the popular scientist and is a former director of Satyajit Ray Film and Television Institute at Kolkata. In the course of the discussion, it was agreed that it was possibly time to revisit Tagore's vision and assess where and why have they been betrayed and what lies in the road ahead? This initiative was picked up by Kahani Kancheti and we decided to partner this process and we will be hosting a series of discussions and publishing articles to understand the vision of Tagore both online and offline. The Talking Tagore series will bring together a number of eminent scholars, academicians, and others connected with the vision of Tagore. What we have with us today is a recorded session of our first such dialogue, which is actually as form of an adda, kahani adda, that's what we are trying to call our shows. And the adda is between Professor Shushanta Dr. Gupta and Dr. Martin Kelch. Let's get into the first round of discussion as to the vision of Tagore, why and where have we gone wrong and what is the way forward. Thank you. Over to you, Shushantada. Thank you very much, uh, Sujit Sanyal. Uh, so, you know, before we start, I want to tell you that af shortly after the book was published, which is December 2021 or so, uh, I think it was in the month of May last year, we had a discussion in Kolkata on the book. And amongst the panelists was also uh, Martin Kemchen, who is our main speaker today. And one of the things that he said, uh, there were many other people in the distinguished panel, but what Martin said, which struck me, was that so many people have been talking about Tagore we hear very eloquent voices about what Tagore wanted or what Tagore did not want, what the vision was, et cetera, et cetera. However, there have been very few doers, people who actually do Tagore, people who replicate Tagore, not necessarily in a publicly funded institution like Vishwavarati, but outside of Vishwavarati. And then I feel today as the first uh, main speaker in your series of discussions on the book, uh, you could not find a better person than Dr. Martin Kemshin, who has been living in this area for close to half a century. And he has uh, been working with many, many activities in the villages, mainly Adivasi villages, and, uh, and really promoting what Tagore presumably thought about what education should be like. Education should be holistic, should be interdisciplinary, should encompass younger students from the uh, very beginning of nursery and patshalas and, and have boundaryless education in the midst of nature where you use nature as a living laboratory to not only learn about uh, the creation of uh, you know, the creator, but also about uh, uh, various scientific 
aspects of uh, things like how insects make their colonies, how animal behavior uh, is seen directly by students sitting under the trees and also uh, learning music, learning arts. So there's no distinction between science, humanities, or anything else. So it is just a very, very uh, comprehensive, wholesome, holistic education that Martin has been involved with. Besides, of course, he has been writing a lot about Rabindranath and Rabindranath's ideals, uh, Rabindranath's model of education, Rabindranath's vision about what India should be like. And so, uh, therefore, I'm delighted that you have found Martin Kemchen today to add to our uh, to our discussion about how to take Tagore's vision forward. With uh, these few words, I will let Martin speak. Thank you, Shushantada. Maybe I should first explain how I got to Rabindranath. What was my incision points? Where did I find an opening to talk on Rabindranath? And what did I do with Rabindranath? I have had my university studies mainly in Vienna, that is in Europe, Vienna, the capital of Austria. And then after doing my PhD in German literature, I came to India, namely to Calcutta, to teach German at Gold Park, Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture. And that I wanted to do for a year, at almost two years, and then return to Germany to have an actual job, to start an actual profession. I wanted to be a cultural journalist a cultural journalist, and I have never become that. I stayed on in Calcutta teaching German for three and a half years, going up and down the country, visiting many places within India, meeting many people, getting engulfed, getting inside the country, in the, particularly in Calcutta, and after three and a half years, I thought it is still not enough. I still have to learn more about the country, getting deeper into the texture, in the psychology of its people. And in order to do this, I would like to have a formal study. And I went to Chennai, which was then Madras, and entered the University of Madras and did an MA in Indian philosophy. In Calcutta, I stayed with the Ramakrishna mission, not only as a teacher, but also I lived in Narendrapur, just outside Calcutta, with the ashram people, with the monks writing uh, right next to me, or myself next to the monks who lived there. So that was obviously a very close relationship with what India, what Hinduism is all about. In Madras, I did something completely different. I stayed with Catholic monks, with the Jesuits, in order to understand how Christianity relates to Hinduism. The institution where I stayed was Aikyalayam, and it's called a dialogue center, dialoguing between two religions, namely Hinduism and Christianity. And as we all know, West, uh, uh, South India is the best place to do this because it has a large number of Christian living there. So I went to various Christian ashrams staying there, learned about the so-called Christian gurus who lived there at the time and at the same time studied at the university, trying to imbibe whatever I could imbibe from the atmosphere in South India. Then I came back to West Bengal. Why? Because after six to seven years staying in India, I wanted to do one thing which I was a little bit afraid of doing, 
a little bit hesitant to do, namely to learn an Indian language, which I had not had done at, uh, as yet. And I realized that this is the one thing which I need to do in order to learn about India, to learn an Indian language. So going back to Madra, going back to West Bengal, I did not go to Calcutta. I went to Shantiniketan for the simple reason that I wanted to live in a quieter and smaller place. I had been in Madras, I had been in Calcutta, two big metropolis, and I was feeling uncomfortable because I am actually a village boy. I stayed in a small town in, in uh, Germany along the Rhine and was not used to big city life. So that was my reason to go to Shantinikita, not Tagore. But as soon as I arrived there in Shantinikita, I started to learn the language, Bengali. And my teacher, who it was a private teacher, she gave me a simple Tagore text, Gitanjali probably, or some similar poem to translate as an exercise. That was after, say, six months of study and learning the script, learning the language, learning the vocabulary, and so on. And then I did get through this poem. I put the Tagore's English translation side by side, and then I it was like a revelation. It was like a shocking revelation. How very different Rabindranath's English translation is from the Bengali original. It does not a translation at all. It is a paraphrase. And a paraphrase which omits certain aspects of the text and adds other portions of the text. So, and um, misses out on rhyme and rhythm and everything that really makes a poem. The English text, although from Tago himself, is a, is, a, is a prose translation, a prose paraphrase, and has none of the values of a poem. I may annoy certain Tagore lovers by saying so, but I stand by it. I've said it many times and I'm still alive, so I've not yet been beaten up. So that uh, was a revelation to me. And then and there, knowing as yet not enough Bengali really, I decided I have to rectify this by translating straight from the Bengali poem, not of course into English, but into my mother tongue, German. And that is the real reason why I stayed on in Shantiniki town so long. I'm there now since 43 years. 43 years. Rabindranath didn't stay that long in Shantiniki town. He stayed there 40 years. Now I am overdoing it. And that is the reason why I stayed on there. And I was busy translating one poem after another until, as of now, about, let me see, eight volumes of Tagore translation, poetry translation, has come out in German. The German biography has come out and several volumes in German, English, and Bengali on Tagore's relationship with Germany. That is uh, the bulk of the work, and we can go on discussing this by uh, Sushantara, you may have a question where I should start and where I should stop, because it's, it's a Ravinda Shagor that I really touched and where I put my little finger in or my little toe in. And one could start discussing this ocean from various sides. 
But now let me ask you, since you have got obviously deep into this entire Rovindo Shagor, which I think is a wonderful word that you have just used. Uh, the question is, do you think that we, and I'm first, I'm, I'm, I have to be a little parochial of being a Bengali, a middle-class Bengali. And uh, in my generation, um, you know, the time since the time we grew up, everything was Tagore from that painting or a photograph or a picture in every household, that bearded man, we were told is a great poet and so on and so forth. Then we in school, we started reading Shahoj Pat. And so we said, oh, this is, and then of course, our valuation changed over a period of time. But uh, when uh, we had gone through, when I had gone through Shushantuda's book, in which he had hit the nail right on the head and asked the question or made a statement, which, whichever way you look at it, of vision betrayed, or shall we call it a vision denied? Have we all, do you think we all have glossed over his vision in uh, you know this whole process of appreciating and seeing, oh, Rovindranath, oh, great. Oh, you know, he's done this, he's done that. But in the process, somewhere down the line, and this is what I was seeing from his, uh, from his book, and, and Shushanjada, you will, I would like you to add, bring in over here. Have we lost the sight of the woods from the trees? I mean, have we, got, uh, have we lost the vision in somewhere? And we are all playing Rovindra Shangit, we are singing, we are, you know, now, of course, now with the Vishwabharati license being open, everybody is turning them into jazz pieces. There are films, his, his stories have been, I would use the word mutilated here and there to, you know, get great, uh, to get bigger scores in the box office. And all kinds of supposedly creative, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what shall I say, creative uh, treatments are being done to his creative work. But somewhere down the line, this, this thing of Vishwabharati, which was basically the dream and basically, you know, that what he said, that, okay, this is where the, the country is. This is where Mother Earth is. This is where education is. All that seems to have gone. And today, exactly, I mean, as of today, as of today, in the last 10 days or so, it has always been in the news for the wrong reasons. I mean, I can't, uh, I really can't for the life of me. And uh, Shushantada, you have been an ex-vice chancellor. <laughs> oh, what exactly is happening? Is, are we losing the, uh, have we said goodbye to the vision? One thing I just wanted to add to what Martin said, uh, maybe he, uh, he had forgotten or he slipped over it, that uh, he actually also got sucked into Vishwabharati a bit because he enrolled himself for his second PhD in the Department of Philosophy and Comparative Religion. Incidentally, I found this name to be very striking. It is not just the Department of Philosophy, which is there in every university, but it's the Department of Philosophy and Comparative Religion. So okay. incidentally, even Tagore's father, Devendranath, used to have discussion meetings here, open meetings, in which he had people from all faiths from all over congregate here to talk about the confluence of the vision as far as religions are concerned. But so, so uh, Martin did do a PhD here with a very famous professor Kalidash Bhattacharya. Uh, so he, of course, was inside Vishwabharati as well. So with this, I will let Martin respond to you and then maybe I'll come back in the end. I was a PhD student, that's right. I was particularly happy to be a PhD student in Vishwarati because I was given the utmost freedom to develop my ideas, to stay and live life, to uh, read uh, Rabindranath, to read Swami Vivekananda, to uh, develop my character, my personality, and so on. I never had as much freedom as I had when I started to live in Shanti Nikitan. They, I did not have to enter a single classroom ever at, uh, <laughs> at uh, Shanti Nikitan because be, being, a, uh, being a PhD student, I didn't need to. And I only had to keep a good relationship with uh, Kalidas Bhattacharya who, is also an ex, who was also an ex-vice chancellor at the time, and I was his last student. And we sat together at his house, at, on his veranda, 
and discussed and talked and talked and talked on everything which is philosophical under the world, under the earth. Now, uh, my subject uh, as a PhD student was not Tagore. I had just entered his his Shagor, his uh, ocean, but it was Sri Ramakrishna. You remember, I was at the Ramakrishna mission. I got interested in uh, Ramakrishna's worldview and I learned in English, the main book on Sri Ramakrishna, which is the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna or in Bengali, Sri Sri Ramakrishna Katamrita. And when I be, uh, become, became a student, it was clear to me that I would like to study him in comparison, since it was comparative religion, with a comparable saint of Christianity. And that for me was Francis of Assisi, the Italian saint of the 13th century. They are immensely comparable. And I did that over a span of years, reading, writing, and then at the same time, translating the Sri Ramakrishna Katamrita from Bengali into German, which was another huge challenge because the rustic Ramakrishna who spoke in very curt and village language, who uh, was, who had a language very much of his own, had to be transferred into modern German. I remember the first volume of the Katamrita I wrote man manually on my typewriter. At that time, there were no computers. On my typewriter, three times, four times, five times. I am revising and making a new manuscript until I saw that you can't do it better, I leave it as it is. And then it was published in three volumes, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth volume. And now it has come out as one volume in another, with another publisher, which is called the Publisher of World Religions in Hamburg. So all this uh, happened and kept me busy along with the study of Rabindranath Tagore. And as I said, I did not only translate, but I also wrote his biography, the only existing Tagore biography in German language. And I found out to my surprise, although and even at that time, so much of Tagore study had been done on his biography, on his life, there was nothing, nothing on Rabindranath's relationship with Germany. So I was the first one who started in the early 90s to go to Rabinda Bhavan in Shantiniketan and to several, to several libraries and archives in Germany to find out about this particular relationship because Rabindranath had been to Germany three times in 1921, 1926, and 1930. And I can say so had a special relationship with Germany. And I tried to bring this out and finally several books in English and in German came out on this subject. And now I see that every, several other people, researchers picked up the subject and developed it from what I had already done. Shantada. Well, <clears throat> Sujit, uh, uh, you had asked Martin another question. Uh, he, I, I think is yet to respond to that, but uh, to set the ball rolling and also uh, your reference to uh, the media attention that Vishwabharati is getting recently. I would only quote what Rabindranath Tagore himself wrote 
to C.F. Andrews, his very close friend, uh, more than 100 years ago. Uh, and these are published in the Routledge publications in 2016. And uh, the, the entitlement, the title is Letters to a Friend, 1913 to 1922. So let me just read out the letters and maybe then the discussion can start from there, from Tagore's own letters. From Antwerp, October 3, 1920, quote, Shanti Nikitan must be saved from our dirty politics. From Paris, September 7, 1920, politics in our country is very petty. It has a pair of legs, one of which has shrunk and shriveled and become paralytic and therefore feebly wants for the other one to drag it on. There is no harmony between the two and our politics in its hoppings and totterings and falls is comic and undignified. Perhaps the strongest repudiation comes from New York on November 4, 1920. Quote, there's one thing I wish to speak to you about. Keep Shanti Nikitan away from the turmoil of politics. I know that the political problem is growing in India and its encroachment is difficult to resist. But all the same, we must never forget that our mission is not political. When I have my politics, I do not belong to Shanti Nikitan. I do not mean to say that there is anything wrong in politics, but that is out of harmony with our ashram. We must clearly realize this fact that the name of Shanti Nikitan has a meaning for us and this name will have to be made true. I'm anxious and afraid that the surrounding forces may become too strong for us and we succumb to the onslaught of the present time. Because this time is troubled and the minds of men are distracted, all the more must we, through our ashram, maintain our faith in Shantam, Shivam, and Advaitam, unquote. This is something that was written more than 100 years ago. Now, you two gentlemen have to discuss on whether there's any relevance of these statements today. Well, all I can say is absolutely prophetic. I mean, that he could have analyzed and used those particular words, which is so apt in today's context is beyond me. I mean, I did not know that he had, of course, I'm not a, in any way, no stretch uh, Tagore scholar, you know, or anything, uh, middle-class Bengali. So, so, I mean, our kind of knowledge is uh, limited to Charulata and, you know, uh, uh, Teen Kunna. So, but the fact is the, uh, that he had written that and way back in 1920, as you say, Absolutely, um, shall I say? And, and he was, and, and he was talking about then India politics, which right. you would agree yeah, is yeah, very, exactly. very different from today. Yeah, and, and today it is even two hundred times worse than what hundred years ago what it was. So it's, but then having said that, if this is what this is a part of his vision, these are his opinion, this is his philosophy. Somewhere, where I, I, I take I, I take the liberty of also telling something hmm. now. Hmm. Since you mentioned, you know, you or many Bengalis or Bengali speaking people would know of Rabindranath through Charulata, hmm. Res Charulata, or Res Ghore Baire, hmm. or Res Tin Konna, yeah. or, or even the Nobel Prize, hmm. or the fact that he wrote many songs. What I had striven to read, to bring out in the book is the visionary Tagore, the universal Tagore, who did not believe in national boundaries, who uh, was extremely international in his views, and he was a great institution builder. He had a view on politics for which people like Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru would, would run and come to Shanti Nikitan very often to pick on his views, but he did, never entered politics, but he had his views on politics. He had his views on Charka. He had his views on Gandhi's idea on the, the, the Bihar earthquake, as you know, these are all well-known facts. So, so he had definite views. And, and the fact that Tagore is actually a real institution builder 
Tigor is really an educationist who uh, created a university outside the mold of the British system, like Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay, which got started in 1858, way, way after uh, Nalanda and Takshila went beyond their existences. So, uh, so Tagore, in fact, brought values of Upanishadic and Vedic ideas and, and uh, created a new model of education. Today, it's, it's in danger. It's falling apart. And so now, uh, but, you know, these things are being replicated outside. And Martin Kemchin is one of the epitomes of a, a pioneer of such initiatives, which he hadn't talked about yet. Well, okay, I uh, can uh, continue uh, with this. Uh, Martin, I, there are two things I want you to talk on. One is, of course, to comment on what Shushantota has said, and you also being a part of Vishwabharati at some point of time. Uh, do tell us that have we sort of discarded, we meaning we in general, the people of India or the people around the world, have we discarded Tagore's vision, number one? And number two, what is the way forward in a situation like this? If the situation is pretty deplorable, there's no mistake about that. But having said that, what is the way forward? Where do we go? And the only thing I personally think, and that's why we all are here, is that uh, we need to uh, create awareness about these issues about Tagore's vision, Vishwabharati's vision, and where we have left him through these talks and chat shows. And hopefully we'll be able to, at some point of time, carry them live into institutions, colleges, and schools, and other places, so that you know we can start into, and that is of course the big plan that we are having. The website that we are developing is also going to be a part of creating the awareness and consciousness. So tell us, Martin, your take on the situation and what do you think is the way forward? Well, Sudhita, to tell you frankly and clearly, I am not here to criticize Vishwarati as it is now. I am now also receiving a visa due to the grace of Vishwavarati. I had to show a paper, a document to the Berlin, that means to the, to the Indian embassy in Germany to invite me to Vishwavarati. And I have to be very careful that I am not um, letting go of that chance. But what can be clearly said, and this is uh, quite obvious to everybody, during the lifetime of Rabindranath Tagore, we had umpteen foreign scholars who taught at Vishabharati, who then also were taught by Indian and Bengali scholars. They sat at uh, the same table and listened to them. There was a give and take internationally. There were visitors from all over the world, many of them also from Germany. And there was a lively discussion on cultural matters and social matters. This has stopped long ago. This has stopped long ago. And one of the proofs I can give out of my own life, when in the 90s, I believe, the German teacher in Vishwarati resigned and uh, was retired. He was a Bengali teaching German. I was asked by the university, that is by my professor, to apply for the post. That would have been on the lines of Tagore's wishes. And I was chosen by the chancellor because I was the only person qualified among the candidates. But the Indian government refused to accept me and said, this has to be an Indian to teach German at Vishwabharati. It was clearly against the precepts, concept of Rabindranath Tagore during his lifetime. So 
Vishwarati has first of all shrunk in its importance, in its radius, in its reach, and become, some people say sarcastically, a Birbom university. And this is um, maybe too harsh, but uh, this shows the, 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 cho the, the cho chosen name is already uh, a pointer to what people are thinking of Vishwarati from outside. Now, this has to be returned. If we want to start a new Vishwavarati and a new idea of Rabindranath Tagore in his world message, we have to start here. And that would be, as I have called it, doing Rabindranath. You know, to, to refashion his institution on international lines, on international scope. And there is a, a good deal of chance right now, because there are many global efforts, many ideas of getting the world, particularly culture, globalized. Vishwarati should be part of that and is at, at the moment at the other side of the spectrum. That is very unfortunate and but that is what it is. So this is one of my statements. How deeply Rabindranath and the Vishwarati has sunk now is another matter which we all have seen, which Shushantada has pointed out very clearly and which we read in the newspapers almost every day. Read the newspaper, you know what it is. Absolutely. But um, uh, Shushantada, there is one factor or many factors that you have mentioned in your book. Is this what uh, I'm just taking off from where Martin had just left off? Um, the bureaucratic influence or what we call is a red tape and the system, the, the, the political system. Now, when I say political system, I'm not referring to any political party, but you know, the laid out system like in his case, uh, this thing came up that whereas Tagore's vision is to get people from outside, you know, it's a, that Vishwa Bharati. Uh, it was very, uh, you know, narrow-minded saying, no, only an Indian can teach and, you know, you cannot have a foreign. Now that's completely going against. Similarly, in your book, Shantada, you have talked about the fact that where Tagore was talking about the free mind, here you have a UGC kind of a you know, set of restrictions saying that number one, do this, number two, don't do that. Number three, you can do this, number four, no, 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 you can't do that, it is not in the books. So everything is going by some kind of a rule book. Now Tagore was outside the rule book. That is the beauty of you know, the Vishwabharati or Tagore for that matter. So um, where will we be going? I mean, yes, but one good thing is that we have to uh, talk more about it and bring it more into the public domain for people to start getting conscious and act on it. Doing Tagore, as Martin had very rightly said. Right, so you see, uh, actually the problem is so complex. Uh, also, it, uh, it's a confluence of the bureaucratic entanglement as well as incompetence, as I would say, from the inside. Uh, for instance, the bureaucrats from Delhi would say every university should have a community college. Of course, Tagore had a community college feeling and the whole Sriniketan experiment that you covered uh, on Umadas Gupta's book from, by Niyogis uh, is about the community, the community bonding. So it, was, it is there. So it is, so it is up to people from inside who have to point out that we look, you know, here is a here is a real model of community interface. Second is uh, today, uh, even in the new education policy, I guess, uh, which I have not read in total, uh, you know, there is a statement that every institution, university should imbibe a school. Now, this is not like Kendriya Vidyalaya or Navodaya school, but a school which is organically bonded with the university. And again, Patagohan and Shikha Shatru are epitomes of that. So, so these models are already in existence, yet they are being eroded. By whom? 
of course, by rules, regulations, et cetera, et cetera, from outside, from the center, but also from uh, inside, okay? So this is something that one has to be aware of. It's a, uh, whether, you know, as I said in the book also, Tagore wanted to build a university far away from Calcutta to be away from the British ideas of education. And, but the flip side, and rather ironically, the, the bad side is that the place became provincial. Uh, it became an employment agency of the local people. And so, and that includes everybody here. So I, I mean, there's, no, uh, there, there's no need to uh, separate one section of community here from the other. Uh, maybe one section wants uh, people in the security staff or, or uh, non-teaching staff. Uh, the, the other section wants the, their own words to be in the faculty of university departments. And so it's a, uh, you know, this kind of inbreeding has, has really killed the place. So, so uh, you want us to also look inward, I think, to uplift the place. Now, now you see the point is that, uh, but then on the other hand, the sometimes, as you know, and I have been in education for many, many years in India, so, uh, very often some rules, regulations, which are imposed from outside. And this is something that parliamentarians debated on the Vishwavarati bill, which is discussed uh, you know, in great detail in the book, uh, that when rules and regulations are imposed, they can actually go away from the Tagorean vision, for instance. You know, uh, how can you expect a person in Songeet or Kola to have PhD, DSC, et cetera, et cetera, or net qualification? Uh, I mean, would uh, people like Konika Bandavadhyay or Shanti Dev Ghosh or Ram King uh, you know, would have passed the net examination to be eligible for a faculty position in Vishwavarati? So, so this has to be pointed out, but in, instead of people saying, oh, we must follow rules, regulations, CAG, which is the audit, okay? But we have to point out that this is, a, this is a different university. This is a different university where, you know, there was no boundaries between uh, the classrooms and the villages outside. The Kolabavon students, you can find them going into the Stantal villages, doing sketches and all that. So there was, there was an, you know, there was an openness about it. But this openness is also in the, uh, in the garb of maintaining property, etc., uh, is now being again eroded. Erosion is the word for actually erection of boundary walls. So, uh, so this is so you see, it, it's the people from inside who are doing all these things. So, uh, and it's, it's a combined effect of uh, then regulations coming. So, you know, but. Very interestingly, today I believe that uh, there's a new uh, dictum saying that uh, uh, Sangeet Kala people, etc., do not need PhD for for faculty recruitment. So this is the new thing that is happening, but it has taken six, seven, eight years to realize, and the damage is already done. So you see, uh, so these are the things that have to come from inside. Somebody has to articulate this thing, saying that this, is the, this was a different kind of university. This was not the real run of the mill place. And so, and that is something that uh, I, I'm afraid has not been done uh, very effectively, uh, intelligently. Uh, so I, I guess that's one of the problems. But then we are, you know, we're again discussing Vishwavarati, but I thought you also wanted to say how to take the vision of Tagore forward yeah. and and so i i would rather like martin to say a few words about uh, his activities in the schools here in uh, goshal danga uh, the rolf shams vidyashram etc which actually uh, very much use the tagorean model and i must say tagore himself learned from the adivasis a lot how the trees are worshiped how seasons are worshiped uh, by the Santals and, and uh, how, uh, I mean, for instance, the, 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 medicine, the local medicines, uh, these are all now being, uh, uh, you know, in the West, they're, they're now being taken over uh, and, and they're patenting them, but uh, these are our old values. And, and so maybe 
through that, through the activities like the one in Goshal Nanga uh, that Martin is involved with. And there are many other such activities that he can, is more qualified to talk about. Uh, we can actually take, take the Tagore vision forward. So in, 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 in a nutshell, what I want to say is that the vision is much, much bigger. And there's a relevance for that today, especially with climate issues, with environmental damages, with, with the narrowness of students getting into uh, you know, this area, that area, and not becoming good citizens of the world. Uh, there's a need to revive that. And I think that, um, uh, that, that, that this is where uh, the hope lies that if we can replicate the Tagorean vision elsewhere, uh, then maybe uh, little, little pockets of, of Vishwabharati will grow. Mm. Yes. Well, uh, you're right. Yeah. yeah, Martin, and I'd love to hear, we would all love to hear about this uh, Ghoshal Daga experiment that you're doing, which I think is more Vishwabharati than Vishwabharati. <laughs> I don't, I have no opinion on this. This is what you people have to say. I just feel, having learned about Rabindranath, having read him, having seen him in action, that he is just too big to just imitate him. He has to be recreated in our modern life. That means apply now the living conditions of today and then in some way try to ask ourselves what would Rabindranath's response be to our modern day problems. Not just imitate, not just replicate, but to recreate him, to be our own Rabindranath as much as we can. So that means we have to get inspired by Rabindranath and not just follow him word by word. Now, I, when I was uh, arriving in Shantiniketan in 1980, I took the cycle, which I still have, by the way, and went in the afternoons around the uh, villages which at that time were very close by. Now, Shantiniki town has become much bigger and the villages have sort of retreated a bit, a few kilometers away. But I took the cycle, went to the villages, sat down with the village people and practiced my Bengali with them in real terms. Because that time I could not understand that well, and it helped me to speak with such people. And then I got to know a few persons better in a particular village. He was uh, already uh, a Madhumik Pass student. He had his class 10, and he invited me to his house. He said, why don't you stay overnight? I did that. And then uh, I became part of his life. I helped him to continue in college. And I told him, when you, when you are helped by me to go to college, you have to help your own village people and start an evening school so that the children will be able to follow their teacher in the day school. And that was obviously a school with in Bengali medium, not Shankali medium, which did not exist and even now exists in very few places. So that is what he did. And this became bigger and bigger and bigger. And slowly uh, we are now have spread ourselves in various villages. We have, uh, we have about 15 teachers. We have a day school in Shankari because uh, the young children of six to get into the government school where they are being taught in Bengali medium is a real trauma 
I should say, a traumatic experience to go from their Chantal background, they speak only Beng uh, Chantali in their own families, then go a few kilometers away and to the school, and then they have to understand and speak uh, Bengali. So this has been for all of them a traumatic experience. And we tried to overcome this by teaching them in Shantari in our own school. That school, Shantada gave the name, Rolf Shams Bedashram still exists. We started in 1996 and it is still going strong with all the defects and problems that we are having every day. So in, in that sense, we became the, a second Rabindranath, or we sort of try to in, we feel inspired by Rabindranath because we did not only choose the core subjects to be taught, mathematics, uh, geography, political science, this and the other, but we also included music, we included dance, we included sports, we included art, that means drawing and painting and and and. And we made a, I made a very interesting discovery. And that is all these so-called extra subjects, music, dance, and drawing, painting, sports, which were all part of Rabindranath's idea and principle of education, you know, to have a holistic education, which would all be included, these art subjects. They came very easily to the Shantar population, to these children, because they grew up dancing and singing in their own families, in Shantali. They grew up uh, to beat the drum, to play the flute. That is part of their culture. So I understood, strangely, that the Chantal children were most adaptable to the Tagore model of education. That they were able to pick up and put life into Rabindranath's pedagogy more easily than Bengali children in the beginning. And that was a, a big revelation to me. And we built on that. And this has in a way become our fame, our recognition from the society around. Shushantara has been there many times. He took part in various festivals, festivals as in the Odinja, uh, Vishwavarati is part of our education. And there is every month there is some kind of festival. So this uh, was the core of our uh, educational principles. And we continued with this. Now we have many Madhumik pass uh, students. Other students are being put into various uh, subjects and uh, professions and training programs. And we are trying to go from there. Our drawback is that we do not have trained teachers because we wanted to have teachers who also come from the same area where the, their students are, namely from poor, uh, who are also coming from poor backgrounds, who are also coming from village backgrounds. And for that reason, also be able to understand their own students much better than if we had hired somebody from Calcutta or from Bulpur or Burdwan. This has been our principle. The drawback is, as I said, that these teachers are not trained and do not follow as yet. We are trying to rectify this, are not yet really following modern methods of education. So this is how it is. Well, I can only tell you, Martin, that uh, there couldn't have been a better way to close this discussion session. But before you do that, yeah. maybe I interject a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Martin, would you, would you also like to talk about the other experiment that you introduced me to 
where this gentleman had picked up destitute children from the railway tracks near Shielda station and then mm -hmm. brought them over and giving them a, a enlightened kind of form of education. Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, I, I will be happy to say a few words on this. You see, if we are looking at Shantiniketan and the environment of Shantiniketan more closely, we understand that various little Shantiniketa are sprouting here and there. One is our own effort there in Goshaldanga and Vishnubhati. Lots of things may still be added on what I have said now. But there are also other efforts at Tagorean pedagogy of which very few people are aware. We only have to look a little further. And one such effort is done by a young man from a Muslim village around Santinikitan, a few kilometers away, who was a student in Calcutta of social work and dedicated himself to the welfare of the station children at Shelda Station. That means the children, boys in this case, who lived on the platforms and lived from little um, thiefery, little help uh, to passengers and and and, who had a very un irregular life, had no family life as such, and simply camped on the platforms at night. He collected them, put them into a house which he near Shelda Station, which he uh, was uh, was uh, help, helping them to be, and then gave them gradually. He first taught them on the station platforms. And then he said, well, why not come to where you are staying at night and let us start a school there? It had to be a long process to make them from, uh, from wild boys to domesticated boys. Uh, I said with this all respect to them. And uh, now for the last one year, they have shifted to Shantiniketan. They have, with the help of a person from America. They have started a trust and a registered society. And they have got this house, which they are renting and living like in an ashram, like the original Shanti Nikitan with Tagore. They are living there, giving them teaching, exposing them to various kinds of experiences within the Shantinikitan area. And I, we both have gone there to discuss them with them, giving them little ideas about the outside world. And they are, I just have to say, lovely people, including Wasim, their guru and inspirator. That is what is happening. And I'm sure if we look closer, there will be other such little nodules of Tagore inspiration all around. So Sujit, while well, this is a, yet another example of where the Tagorean vision still is alive, I also wanted to point out something else and then we can close maybe the discussion. But now that I have no official uh, association with Vishya Bharati and I'm an ordinary citizen of this uh, part of the world, I do mingle with uh, normal people. You know, uh, by normal, I don't mean not abnormal, but normal people. And, and they are shopkeepers. They are, uh, you know, uh, the frame makers, which uh, that, that you can find in my room here. Uh, uh, and they, they also make cane furniture, cane chairs, cane lights, cane lamps, etc. And then what astonishes me is to look into their background that actually at one time they have been in Vishwavarati, either with Kalavavun or, uh, or Shilput uh, Bhavun, uh, you know, uh, or uh, I mean in, in, in Sriniketan, uh, or uh, Sangeet Bhavan, because there are Baul people also in and around. So, you know, this is how the, the Tagorean vision 
is actually living not in a part of a of a government supported university but outside ordinary people they do beautiful craft beautiful village craft and they are so it's a pleasure to actually stay in shantiniketan uh, as much as martin said that what enticed him here is a is a village background and the rural background and the clean air uh, the birds the trees the flowers but also these these very gifted people who uh, actually are keeping the tagorian vision alive so i guess this, this is a point that maybe uh, maybe it did not come out as a focal theme in our discussion but how the tagorian vision is still relevant and is actually living maybe not in vishwavarthi but outside vishwavarthi also well this is what i was coming to and um... frankly this is a great note of hope on which we will be closing because you're right everything did not happen within the presence of vishu bharati as vishu bharati the vision of tagore visa vi vishu bharati or visa vi the world can always be practiced outside like you all are actually doing now your school and you know this shialda experiment and as you said you know the 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 guy who makes frames uh the shopkeeper they are all alumni of vishu bharati that gives you the uh, you know the feel of uh, feeling so proud so and the proud is because this is what tagore had so yes i think what we need to do and this is the future that i see because within the system i don't think i personally don't think you know we can't move around much because you know it's got after all a chessboard has those 64 blocks uh, square so you have to either move from here to there or there but you're still within that framework but you can go outside the chessboard you can go outside the chessboard like you all have actually done and that's that's the testimony of the fact that if there is a will to carry his vision forward and i was asking you martin the way forward this is the way forward i think you said it very and i'm glad shushant uday you uh, uh, reminded him to include that uh, the shialda story which is like amazing i was absolutely well well i i should say that i have met this uh, these boys from wasim school uh -huh. and they they you know i mean they, they are so polite with you they they are so articulate they are confident and so now to bring them out of their way of what they were doing yet they were of course wanting to go to kolkata to spend the puja with the family etc yeah. but come up again and then become independent on their own and they can they can actually do great things in life i feel so i think that's another another uh, paradigm korean vision exactly so there is we are ending at a positive note so it the uh, keeping the vision alive is not just a matter of discussion i think what you all have done it's a movement i rather use the word movement because in every sphere outside of the so called boundaries you know there is still a kind of a boundary of the vishu bharati campus i think outside the boundary more things are happening to keep him alive and you are you all are really doing that so i think we would like to end with that with that big hope that you all have given to us to all our viewers and listeners who are going to listen to this this is going to be on youtube so it will be like a perpetual presence and i'm sure there will be more such sessions in future so thank you very much for joining us joining kahani kanchiti is indeed extremely grateful to both of you and we are very proud of the fact that you know we have been able to have you both together and uh, look forward to more such sessions in the near future thank you very much for being with us thank you thank you thank you amar mu